I'm David Walters, and this is Innovatio. Welcome back to the show, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, the podcast series that we are putting out at the moment, um, as you have seen, has been looking at innovators, pioneers, and industry thought leaders. Um, today's guest really encompasses all three of those. Um, Matt, welcome to Innovatio. Thank you very much, David. Happy to uh, happy to be on. I'm not sure that I fulfil any of those. Uh, so yeah, thank. Thank, thanks for the thanks for the lead in there, but um, yeah, we time will time will tell. We'll let your listeners and viewers judge uh, judge this. <laughs> uh, it's great, it's great. Um, uh, just for context, uh, Matt has been in the industry for many years, as we'll get to hear about, um, uh, slightly longer than I have actually. And I think it was through um, you joining our pass um, uh, initially uh, as one of the supporting directors there, um, which is where I, I think where we. We first met and became introduced. Um, before we get into that, though, Matt, um, you've been in the industry for quite a while now. Um, why don't we tell the audience a little about you, how you became into using the technology, um, and some of the work that you're doing today with it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my story is quite a long one, um, so I'm I'm not I'm not going to bore not going to bore listeners uh, uh, with that, um, but. Essentially, my background is um, forestry and arboriculture. I was a tree surgeon by trade, um, and I later became an arboricultural consultant. And I had a bit of, I've always had an interest in um, aviation, but my eyesight was never good enough to uh, join the Air Force. I wanted to be a, um, a helicopter pilot in the Army Air Corps, but my eyesight wasn't good enough. So I slid sideways into countryside recreation and then arboriculture. Um, and I've, I've always had an interest in model aviation and manned aviation. And I became aware, I suppose it would have been maybe 2011, 2012, something like that, that with the advent of, or the move away from nickel cadmium batteries to lithium polymer batteries, that it was starting to become feasible to um, stick a sensor, a payload, a camera, whatever, up in the air for, for longer periods of time than had traditionally been possible with NICAB batteries. And that kind of led me really to, um, I, I can't remember, it was, it was maybe radio controlled model engineering or something like that. There was some magazine or something. Um, and I saw the early drones starting to come out, maybe micro drones, something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, so I had a little bit of an inkling that the way things were going to go and I kind of kept a bit of an eye on it. And then out of the blue, um, DJI, obviously, DJI, we all say G, why is that? DJI released the Phantom 1. And as you know yourself, it was an absolute game changer. Um, so I did a little bit of research and um, they didn't have a very good reputation at the time. So I went and bought myself a little um, blade quadcopter, I think it was, it's somewhere in the office here. And... Um, I started to do some experimentation with that and that just started an exponential curve of growth really which uh, which led us led us to where we are today so yeah it's interesting actually a friend of mine uh, Rory Game he uh, he doesn't he's not a commercial operator but he's been doing FPV for many years but before even drones were coming out because he's a 3D helicopter pilot uh, he was flying a T-Rex uh, one of the big ones 600 I think with a uh, camcorder uh, on the front of the helicopter on the nose with a servo controlled gimbal um, and uh, even that still amazes me you know that those type of techniques were being used before we even kind of got to the stage of drones let's say yeah um, yeah it's fantastic how I was never I was never good enough I was never good enough to get uh, um, uh, 3d fly and I, I and to be honest I kind of it's all a lot of noise and movement, isn't it, really? Let, let, let's be honest. You know, there are guys out there like Danny Rose, et cetera, who are uh, Mike Foyle, who are absolutely ace on the sticks. But 
Um, really, it's the scale flying and flying in a scale manner that um, that interests me. And as part of my journey, I was lucky to work with some guys from um, uh, Switzerland called Denny Cam, uh, and they were in right at the very start as well. And they, um, Dionis, their their lead pilot, he managed to put a, um, I think it was a Sony camcorder on the front of the helicopter. And I think that was before 2010 as well. Wow. It was really, really early on. And the footage was was all over the place. But yeah, abs- absolute, uh, absolute game changer, really. So Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So with your businesses, you run uh, Rover Group, uh, which is a combination of a variety of uh, different businesses. Um, now, I obviously know you through uh, Rover UAS, uh, the drone aspects. Um, so with that in mind, you're quite entrepreneurial. Do you utilize drones across all of your businesses that you operate? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is probably a good point to, to, to plug the book, isn't it? I mean, if people want, absolutely. If, people want to get, if people want to get the full story, they can, you know, best-selling author and all that rubbish, uh, they can grab a copy of the book and, and, and read the whole thing if they're, if they're on a long flight or really, really bored on a train journey. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the reason I got into drones was to use them for um, tree inspection and for forestry. And we were, frankly, we were too early to market. Um, so we went through the whole process of getting our, what was it, PFAW, wasn't it? Permit permit for aerial work back That's in it. the day. Um, so uh, I came to the industry, if you want to call it an industry, I hate that term, but I, I came to the sector the industry about the time that Euro USC um, was starting to develop allegedly a bad reputation for allegedly all sorts of things, uh, and I went with Resource Group and I went through all the went through all the training. Um, we got our P4, and I went back to my existing clients and said, "Look, we've got this fantastic technology. In fact, one of the old aeronavics frames is is just back a shot." And um, went back to them and said, "Look, we've got this wonderful tech." Let's um, let's get it out there. We can do all these wonderful things for you. And they just looked at me blankly, to be honest. Um, and the phone started ringing for um, uh, TV work, commercial work, uh, laterly uh, feature films and stuff like that. And I had no background whatsoever in um, creative video or even really creative photography. I had a passing interest in photography, but not really in, in videography. And it wasn't until really we got into drones that, that I really saw the, the potential there. And actually, it's come full circle now. Um, and uh, although I'm often tied to the office r- writing boring technical reports, I hanker for the days because I operate as a pilot for hire as well. Um, so I'm lucky enough to occasionally go out and fly on some real um, high profile stuff for all, all sorts of well-known um, industry people and uh, it's really great I mean I love nothing more than getting out on the on the creative projects but I digress so we took uh we took our drone capability to our existing clients they looked at us blankly and we moved into creative video hence the split into Rover UAS or or um uh unmanned aviation services as it was at the time we've shortened it now the other side of the company Rover Environmental has always chugged along in the background um, but was never really viable to introduce drone technology to one because of the legislative barriers, um, which are starting to fade away a little bit now. Um, two, the equipment was too complex and too expensive to be uh, transported easily to jobs. Um, and three, clients really didn't see the value of it. So although we now use drones on every tree survey we do right across the UK, wow. um, it's, a, it's a value add. So in terms of drone missions, if you if you want some numbers, we're flying probably somewhere in the region of 25 individual missions a week at the moment. Um, and the vast majority of those are done with the Mavic Mini on that side of the business, because all we're looking to do is introduce overhead, overhead intelligence essentially into the, into the reporting structure. And we find that that adds real, real value to our, um, to our clients. The other thing that we use within that side of the business um, are fixed wing systems um, for habitat mapping um, and uh, survey work as well. Predominantly wind farms. Um, we work with a well-known um, UAS operator up in Shetland and we mapped all of the interior of Shetland um, for the, I think it's the largest wind farm project in the in the UK or it might even be the largest onshore yeah, wind project in, in Europe. Yeah, I'm I, know, sure. I know the one you're um, talking about. Yeah. Now. 
Yeah, for Rory. And I mean, that was, you know, that was an incredible use of the technology. So it's something that I've I've been very passionate about and it combines my uh, twin passions of, of technology um, and, and aviation, really. And that led me to, to getting involved with the Trade, Trade Association, RPAS UK, meeting up with yourself, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I finished my term with them maybe two, two and a half years ago as, as, as vice chairman. But I got involved in an awful lot of regulation at very early stage. And that's something I'm very proud of. And it was really enjoyable as well. Yeah, and I think that's where I uh, kind of put you in the pioneer bucket because I think it's people like yourselves um, and our pass as an organisation, uh, which I honestly don't think they, they still don't get enough credit for the work they do behind the scenes, um, but enabled us to probably be where we are today, you know, to have that voice, have that mechanism as a, as a trade body, help steer that conversation with uh, the regulator. Um, because I think... Uh, and this is going back a few years, um, probably when, probably 2014, where drones were seen, uh, let, let's be honest, you know, a thorn in the side of the regulator. You know, uh, we were uh, interfering with aviation, let's say. But I think along with our past, we helped to change that perception. You know, we were seen as actually professionals operating professional vehicles um, and enabled that kind of conversation, you know, to, 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 to move forward and to grow. And that's kind of why I put you in the, uh, one of the pioneer buckets, because I think, again, you know, without you and the RPAS guys, we, we truly wouldn't be where we are today. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I was part of a, I was part of a big team. Um, and I, and I mean, I fell into that by accident, um, so Phil Tarry uh, was one of the founding members. It was, his, it was his puppy, really. It was his brainchild. Um, I think he runs an NQE now, doesn't he? Halo, yeah, Halo, Halo Drones. Drones. Um, and uh, I keep in contact with him. Great guy. Um, but it was his passion and his baby. And I mean, he was the real driving force behind it at the time. He recruited me into the, into the trade association, initially as um, PR and marketing director, which at the time I knew nothing about, and now it's become my passion hilariously. Um, but um, yeah, but he surrounded himself with some fantastic individuals, um, you know, and I think probably nearly all of them have moved on now, which is, uh, which is a shame. Um, and I know a lot of them are mutual, mutual friends uh, like Angus and Sue, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what, what he did for the industry, I mean, people don't realize that the, the legislative environment that we operate in now, um, and particularly the OSC, OSC mechanism, is a direct result of our past literally intervening with Jerry um, and having a direct conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't think people realise that. And like you say, our past doesn't get the credit it deserves. It gets a lot of stick. I'm not sure, possibly, how relevant it is in some areas now. Um, but certainly, you know, it could it could be the glue that pulls a lot of associations together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as the industry has developed, we've seen uh, a change in the regulators' perception on the use of drones. You know, there's now a dedicated drones team, uh, whereas before we were dealing with the civil aviation on the whole and some of their safety officers, uh, Jerry Corbett, etc., um, and Mike Gadd back when he was uh, at the CAA. And now we have a, a drone department in the UK CAA and in addition to that, now we have an innovation sandbox team where they're looking at the new types of technology and development. And and then coming out from uh, the DFT, we have this future flight, which is also being used to fund additional roles, not just at the CIA, but also at Ofcom as well, to see where some of the challenges might be coming uh, with drone use, electronic conspicuity, different control links, CTC, etc. cetera. Um, so it really has from... Uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Maybe like a drone space infrastructure perspective. Uh, you know, it's really developed, you know, and helped shape some of the framework that, that we see today. Um, and it's certainly beginning to gain pace, I think. Um, I think from, from working from where I came from in the IT industry uh, 10, 15 years ago now, um, I thought that was a fast-paced moving industry, you know, changing technology every two years, et cetera. And then I think when I uh, when I bought my first DJI S1000 with the Sony Next gimbal, and I thought, oh, I've got the mm -hmm. latest and greatest tech. 
six months later, DJI Inspire One comes out, and I've just spent six, seven grand on a DJI S1000. I'm like, yeah, that, uh, that's that, that's moved quick. That's changed quick, and it's interesting to see now with the manufacturer's perspective where we literally every four or five months there's a new piece of technology coming out new sensor it's, capability yeah, and, and i mean i i think sometimes people that try and enter the sector and start a drone services company drastically underestimate the level of investment that's required just to just to keep current um i mean we've made some really hard choices in terms of um equipment and procurement over the years and some of those haven't panned out you know like for most people there's bits of equipment in boxes in this office that have never been out and probably cost 20 grand um and it's it's trying to predict where it's going to go you know and i think people quite often neglect that key understanding of who their client is and what they're likely to want and over the years there's been so much over promising and under delivering that the adoption now of um, uh, what am I trying to say? The adoption now of drone technology within um, existing businesses is on a massive uptake. I mean, we're seeing it all, all the time. Um, my special projects manager, Paul, was out mapping a landslide at a, quite a famous castle up here in um, Scotland yesterday, I think it was. Um, and he saw a wing truck flying around Aberdeen Airport. Really? And I mean, you, you just, you hardly ever saw another drone up here, let alone another fixed wing system. Um, so, you know, the, up, the uptake of the equipment now, particularly amongst surveying and inspection uh, crews is, is astronomical um, and good on them as well because they're the experts ultimately. You know, where we used to add massive value because we could put the thing in the air and manage all the, all the problems and um, all the little foibles that come about with operating drone kit, uh, it very rarely goes wrong now. Um, and, you know, I know safety is important. Of course it is. Uh, and it's all about managing that piece of air that you're operating in and ensuring that, um, A, nobody comes into it. Um, but how many people have had a quadcopter fail? I mean, yeah. I don't know of anybody, as you say, I've been in the industry seven years, know an awful lot of well-known operators, and I don't know anybody that's had a DGI piece of equipment fail due to a motor failure. And I'm talking about the real prosumer stuff like the DJI Inspires, the Mavics, that yeah. kind of thing. You know, touch, touch wood, we've got six Inspire 2s, I think, um, and we've never had anything fail mechanically. The software and the firmware is an utter pain in the backside, um, but mechanical failures are extremely rare. And when those mechanical failures are extremely rare, it's more likely for people to adopt the, uh, adopt the technology. I mean, as you, you know, the aeronavics kit that we used to have was constantly going wrong um, at a mechanical level. And we were having to solder things out in the out in the site and on film sets and all sorts of things. But that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's, a, a, you know, a valid point. If we look at the quantity of drones that are now out there on the market and actually the number of failures um, that occur, when you actually dive into the AIB reports, et cetera, if an AIB report has been filed, um, most of the times you can look at it and go, that could have been mitigated with CONOPS. You know, with good solid CONOPS, you could have mitigated. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, what had happened. Mm. But how but how reliable is that AAIB data anyway? Um you know, because as you pointed out there, the only people that are reporting are those that are in the upper echelons anyway, or have to, um, you know, like your police forces, your emergency services, your larger companies. Um, they're obviously ticking tick tick the boxes and um, are submitting the reports. I think RPAS, particularly Angus Benson Blair, tried some years ago to introduce a, an operator-driven um reporting process that would be open and transparent and honest uh but there was still you know this perceived uh notion that you were gonna, gonna somehow get into trouble i mean we had an incident with our eb i'm trying to think what it i can't remember what it was now because it wasn't me that was operating <laughs> uh and 
um, we went to the AAIB with that and uh, they were more interested in us and what we were doing in the equipment uh, than they were in investigating the incident. This was a couple of years ago now. Um, but yeah, it fi- I can't remember where it failed. Some- something went wrong with it. But uh, yeah, it's um, that that just culture isn't quite there yet, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, yeah. And I think that's something that has disappointed me about the, the uh, I avoid using the word industry, the space with operators <laughs> now. You know, they're, I think I'm quite fortunate because I'm surrounded by people that I would classify as like highly professional individuals, not just when they're operating droves, but generally the way they conduct themselves and business, they are a professional um, and it's like any health and safety incident, even that happens in the workplace, you know, you report it for the appropriate channels. And like, as you mentioned, you know, you had a failure on an EB, you know, you take it to the appropriate body and say, hey, look, this has happened. It might not just be me that has this issue at some point. It, maybe it's a manufacturing failure. Maybe it's a, a, an issue um, at that point in time with the, the satellite system that the system's communicating with and positioning itself with, you know, you might get more reports on this day about other systems failing, you know, you, it's about sharing that data and being transparent. And um, I think the, the, the issues lie kind of on both sides, you know, the ability to, to share that data. I'd also have you consider the possibility that a lot of this comes down to training and mindset as well. And with the dumbing down of the i'm not going to say authority because that's not what i'm trying to say but with the with the dumbing down and the creation of a new drone department within the caa uh, and the whole feel of it at the moment and i'm not involved at a, a regulatory level like i used to so i'm just talking through you know what word on the street the feel that i get is that actually drone operation isn't viewed as professionally as perhaps it was a few years ago because of the level of training and also it was deemed to be more part of aviation in scotland here when we deal with um, air traffic units and stuff like that now it's so dumbed down everything is pushed through the police force and other stakeholders because they really don't want us involved in 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 aviation at all and unfortunately i feel that and I've got, I, you know, I have to declare an interest because obviously I am interested in, in aviation. I'm an aviator myself. But by pushing it uh, and, and kind of um, uh, moving it outside the aviation bubble a little bit, I seem, I, I seem to feel that there's just not the level of professionalism amongst pilots that perhaps there was. There isn't that mindset. They've even removed the term, and I know this comes up over and over again, the term pilot in command has gone now and it's remote pilot. And I used to love that when I was teaching because you could say to people, you are pilot in command. Ultimately, the decisions that you make, you've got to, you know, you've got to stand by, you've got to die by, you've got to be able to justify those decisions. The buck stops with you. When I send guys out of the office here, we still use that term. Uh, It's like the buck stops with you ultimately. You know, if you go to site and you phone me up and you say, I'm, you know, I don't feel safe flying, there's a problem, whatever, I'll 100% stand by them because they're there making that decision. Um, and I just feel that's quite a big issue these days. And this is the trouble with three hour online courses. But I'd need another half an hour of your time, David, to get on my on my high horse on that one. No, um, I know. It, it, it just, you know, and, I, and I've just recently gone through the whole GVC A2 C of C thing, as have all my. So I think we were pretty much the first in the UK to get our cards from the CAA. Um, And, you know, if that's the, there's some good content in there, but if that's the benchmark, a couple of hours online course, then, you know, there's, we're going to see more incidents, I think, in that kind of, not the toys, but that kind of mid-level inspire size drone operations in and around congested areas. I think we're going to see more dramas through pilot error because we're on the same trajectory as manned aviation now and we're finding that you know the equipment's becoming super reliable and the pilots aren't yeah it's certainly going to be interesting with the uh, new proposed EASA regulations uh proposed to be coming out uh, they were delayed they were supposed to be out by now but i think with everything going on with brexit and covid um 
just just some minor issues. Um, they'll probably be delayed now till um, December. Um, but even the aspects, some of the aspects of that, you know, has has raised a few eyebrows, including my own. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely going to be some more challenges, uh, you know, coming up with the industry and it moving forward. I'm hoping there'll be. Well, you know, I mean, ultimately, as we as we we all say, and I've been saying for I don't know five years, I suppose, is the fact that you know drones are tools. Ultimately, they're a, they're a tool to, to to carry out a job. And sooner or later, every builder, every plumber, every roofer, every inspection engineer is going to have a drone in the little box in the boot of his car. We virtually do that already on the tree survey side of business. Um, we pull it out, we do the job and we go away. But I feel that we've got that culture and that that grounding in aviation to enable us to make safe, pragmatic uh, decisions on site. And, and it's a real balancing act between, you know, over regulation and, and, and letting the letting the sector develop. And um, I wouldn't want to be in those shoes at the CAA. That's that that's for sure. But I just think if we could somehow get the training right and get the mindset right, then, you know, whether you work at B&Q and you've, you've bought a drone to inspect your roofs or, you know, whether you're flying a heavy lift drone on a, on a movie set, then, you know, at least the mindset is right. And that's a good starting point. And it seems to me like we're, we're, we're skipping past that at the moment. So Yeah, no, I, I, I have to agree. And I think... I think that's where I have, you know, uh, frustrations in 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 the space because, again, been in the industry, uh, there's the same amount of time of you, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, we surround ourselves with these professional people who we've been on this journey with through this industry, who all have the same mindset as us. You know, we have strict con ops, we operate as per the ANO, we've helped get the industry kind of where it is today. Um, and we've and we've had to navigate some of those hurdles to give operators what they have today. I guess I mean, as you mentioned earlier, Angus Benson, you know, pioneering the uh, congested area operational safety cases. It was no. Well, I've or still got the audio file on my phone somewhere of when he did. It wasn't Zoom. It was whatever we had five years ago when he back briefed our past members on how he'd gone through that process. It's about an hour and twenty minutes long. Um, and every now and again, I have a quick, a quick listen just to just to remind myself of the utter BS that um, that we all had to go through. Uh, the the uh, chaos, as it was known back then, which was a quickly uh, retitled operational safety case. Um, Absolutely. But Absolutely. You, I would say though, Matt. I mean, you obviously, um, still self-employed, still running your business now for many years, and you've managed to navigate some of these challenges uh with regulation and uh from an industry perception of the adoption of drones what's what's been your highlight if you could pick one thing that you've done over your years of using unmanned systems what would it be it's it's absolutely it's working on a high pressure um film set or drama flying heavy lift drones in the middle of the night with no camera on with no lights on getting eaten alive by midges <laughs> the camaraderie, the teamwork. I've been lucky enough to go all over the world um, and, and do this, work with some fantastic people, make friends for life, um, and they're the highlights. Although it's an utter pain in the backside doing that kind of work, it really does give you a buzz, um, and, and it's still the absolute cutting edge of the sector, in my opinion. Yeah, and I guess seeing your own work up on the, up on the big screen you know, seeing it come to fruition, you know, uh, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting goosebumps from when I see my own stuff um, on, the, on the screen. Um, you know, at the time, you were just, it's so high pressure and people think it's all glamorous working on a film set and working oh, on it's TV not at all. And I mean, you know, ultimately that... The, You're lucky you if know, you get a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 well, the food's usually good. I mean, it's, it, it, it's nice to see it on the big screen, but quite often months and months of work don't make, don't make the big screen. You know, yeah. it's when you're lying on your back in, in the heather in the middle of nowhere, you know, trying to get something to work because you've got the director of the crown or whatever looking over, looking over your shoulder. You know, it's, um, it's good, it's good fun. And I love getting out of the office and, and, and doing that kind of work. That's, that's where I really enjoy it, you know no gps it's all you know manual or atty 
no monitors, no nothing. It's just you with your lo eyes locked on that drone, trying to bring that director's vision to life while everybody else deals with the the, the creative side of stuff. I I love that. That's um, that's my favourite favourite part of the the business. But it's the one that generates the least amount of revenue. Yeah, uh, that's true actually, and and that's that's one area that I missed, and as an unfortunately, what, what why I don't really fly uh today you know i just i just couldn't i just couldn't make it work but it's it's great to be in a position where i can um you know through uh work being on the working groups now and having those conversations with the regulators and the dfts um you know being able to hopefully uh, navigate and steer them to enable um, my colleagues the professionals around me to have greater capabilities when operating especially with the you know operational safety cases etc um so although i miss the flying i do enjoy being able to you know help being one of the enablers i guess similar to what you did back in the day at pass uh you know and help create a uh, a future proof shall we say because we've got a future flight coming up a future proof uh, framework that enables the next steps um and that's actually a nice kind of ending point, really. What is the next step for Rover Group uh, and you guys? What have you guys got coming up? Just to just to touch on your last point there. I mean, yeah, you know, if you've ever read any um, of the older kind of aviation books, I mean, I've got a, a, a picture of Winkle Brown up on the wall in here just to remind myself every now and again. And I bet probably only 50% of your listeners will know who he is. But listen to, listen to his audio books um you know or, or read his read his life story because where you are where you're at at the moment i don't think you realize this sometimes is that you're you know you're right at the very start of all of this and one day you know people will look back and go well these guys were right at the very start right at the very right at the very cutting edge you know imagine a time when people weren't flying around in in multi-rotors around cities um you know because yep. it, it, it will be coming um where do i see us going oh who knows? Who knows? Um, the This drone journey has been completely unpredictable and the drone side of my company is the least predictable. Um, and yeah, who, know, who knows where it's going to go? We've got lots of interesting, exciting things bubbling away from training airports and airport staff and helping them adopt drone technology through to, um, you know, wind farm mapping and all that kind of stuff, plus the creative creative stuff bummed in as well so uh bummed in is that a thing i think i mean bunged in don't i um so yeah i mean it's it's well, it who, knows post. Where we're gonna, who knows where we're gonna go next i'll have to i'll have to uh i have to write another book one time yeah so that... <laughs> uh, absolutely no uh, absolutely well look, it's, it's been great to talk to you uh and, and nice to catch Thanks up actually me. Uh, it, it's been it's been really great. Um, and again, if anyone uh, TV production world is looking for like locations in Scotland, Matt is your man. Matt knows every single nook and cranny of Scotland and surrounding islands. And um, if you follow me on on Instagram, you'll occasionally see him out on the Isle of Skye filming something for a production series. So to so get in touch with Matt, uh, Matt, how can we how can listeners reach you um, with regards to that? So the, easy, the easiest way is just to type R-O-A-V-R um, into, into Google and up will come one of the many ways of getting in contact with us. Um, the main creative website is uh, www.rover.agency. That's R-O-A-V-R.agency. Um, and if you're interested at all in the environmental side of things, then that's rover-environmental.co.uk. Uh, fantastic mate i'll ensure all the links are in the description um, with the video um it's been great to talk to you and again thank you to the listeners for joining us today on today's show um i hope you've enjoyed as much as i have uh speaking with matt and listening with uh about his in-depth knowledge of industry and the journey um you know we, we've come a long way but as matt mentioned you know we're really only just starting to to get on the crisp of the next kind of phase of uh the unmanned uh, aviation and where it's going next um join me on the next show for myself dave walls thank you very much for listening remember to subscribe and thank you for matt again um see you on the next one